Welcome to this show is not about menopause because menopause is only one day. So that would make for a pretty short show. Hi, my name is Shirley. I'm the founder of Menopause Chicks and privileged to be your host for these important health conversations. This is where you will find quality information and key insights about all things women's health, the years before menopause and every year after. Today is gynecologist day, and it is much more than that. So buckle up. My guest is Dr. Natalie Gamash, one of the most passionate, interesting individuals I have ever had the pleasure of meeting. Her journey has taken her from teaching to gynecology to menopause expert, and wait for it, some even know her as Dr. Jin. I seriously can't wait for you to learn from this woman. Please welcome Dr. Natalie Gamash. Shirley, it's an absolute pleasure. We had dinner not that long ago. Oh my gosh, the, uh, the time Finally. just flew by. Yes. I wish we could have recorded our conversation, but- You took notes. I did, I had to get my <laughs> pen out. And, it, and what I wrote in big capital letters was the word ROAR. Yes. Because I asked you, what is the one thing that you really want to do right now or see happen in the area of women's health? Why did you choose the word roar? I want women to stand up and roar. I need this time to become the time where women decide that they're not going to take no, as in man, no, pause for an answer, <laughs> that they need to get angry with the system. They need to demand that the follow-up to the day of menopause becomes the celebration of the rest of their lives and that the society around us, the community around us, and the healthcare system around us levitates us to the level where we should be because we are providers of this society. We are so important and we don't deserve to be sleepless, depressed, anxious, and heating. Mm, I so why roar? <laughs> a roar. Um, of course, that's beautiful to me and gives me goosebumps. Why aren't we there yet? Oh, well, how far back would you like to go? <laughs> you tell me, sister. <laughs> I think we were there. It must have been mm. July 16, 2002. You think um, we were there then? Yes. Okay. I think we had been there for 61 years. Okay. I think we were making leaps and bounds in terms, of, in terms of progression. We could go back to the moment in 1978 where the true bioidentical hormones mm -hmm. came by prescription in Canada, mm -hmm. unbeknownst to any of us as the jargon got introduced sure. very soon after the infamous disastrous women's health initiative study and that's the date you're referring exactly. to exactly right so the 17th so. of july 2002 an infamous disastrous study of nuclear proportion exploded in the face of all north american women um to be ignored mostly by Europe and the rest of the world because mm -hmm. it was an American study that by foundation and design took a wrong turn in terms of how they decided at the end to analyze this very precious data, which if it had had a chance initially to be uh, um, appropriately analyzed by design would have given us the data we knew to move forth and launch into menopause hormone therapy in a safe way, valid and helpful for health for women for decades to come. And that little mistake on that day completely blew the entire fear of hormone therapy. And the word menopause basically disappeared from all the teaching institutions and became this kind of... Um, a celebration of other aspects of approach to menopause, which mm -hmm. steered women, women, you know, I, we got thrown under the bus. Yeah. It, it's, there's no other way. And the ramification of that study, we are barely coming to the surface. We are coming to the surface nowadays we are. because women five years ago, 
finally got angry enough to take it upon themselves to search and read and demand. Unfortunately, we still have a medical system in North America that is not aligned again with the importance of this knowledge. Uh, very few medical students, very few family physicians actually get trained on those topics because in 2002, they were told that hormone therapy killed women yeah. and we shouldn't be talking about something that we couldn't recommend anymore. So let's unpack this yes. just uh, for those listeners that aren't familiar with sort of the dis the catastrophe, yes. if I can use that yeah, word. Absolutely. The intention of the Women's Health Initiative study was good. Yes. It was absolutely. bang on. Absolutely. Absolutely. What was the intention? The intention was basically after 61 years of observational and cohort study that had made us realize that there appeared to be a benefit to hormone therapy for health. We knew the foundation of wellness. Yeah. Um, there was never a question about that, but it became obvious over that 61 years prior to. So hormone therapy prescription number one in Canada in the world. It's a moment in history in 1941. So by the time the study got published, the intention was basically to demonstrate that hormone therapy was, as a matter of fact, a benefit to health for women taking it. A little mistake was made. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could turn back the clock, yes. do you think that we would have been better without the study at all? No. If I could turn back the clock to 1997 right. when the recruitment started right. and the design of the study took place, I would have not involved the 60 and 70 plus to pack the numbers in a study that was going to cost a billion dollars yeah. and needed to launch as fast as possible. Yeah. So the intent was for women 50 to 59, young in menopause, starting on hormone therapy for the every best window of opportunity when they're still healthy and we can promote that health forward um, to see what they look like 10 years later. Mm hmm. The but where was the is, flaw in the, the recruitment? The flaw is, well, they allowed women who were, so it was, you know, as studies go, should be a fairly pure design and, you know, population demographics. Um, the women who were invited in at the last minute, the 60, 69, 70, 79, were very less than healthy. There were 33% of women who had hypertension, 19% of women were smokers, 7% of that population already had a heart attack, a stroke, or a massive blood clot. And we are taking women in their 70s with 20 years of pathology in or behind them from menopause, right. and we are hoping that putting hormone therapy or sprinkling hormone therapy on top of them is going to Right. Prevent aging, prevent disease process, revert chronic illnesses. The biggest mistake is the fact that they did not stratify the group when they presented the initial analysis. The group was basically a melding pot of 50 to 79 years old who gave us the impression that breast cancer and heart disease were prominent when they were for Already women out of 10, 000, yeah. and they were absolutely all exclusively, which took five years to discover with the reanalysis of that study, exclusively in the group of 70 to 79 year old on, can I mention brands or would you rather go ahead. not, yeah, go ahead. were, had a uterus and therefore had to have been on Provera. Mm -hmm or medroxyprogesterone acetate to protect the uterus while they were taking Premarin. And starting at age 70, that's the discovery we made. Not such a good idea. Yeah. But 20 years later from that study now, they've actually followed all of those women who were part of the initial study, the young group, it actually turns out that at the end of the road, 20 years later, there are no more breast cancer and heart disease in the young women who started on hormone therapy back then compared to their sisters who were in the placebo group and never used any. And for me, the layperson receiving that information in 2002 and studying it in more recent mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. 
None of that was explained. By the time the sound bites got to the media outlets, got to the cover of Time magazine, got to the front page of the newspaper, all of the relevant points of what you're explaining were removed. Of and course. it basically ended up as the soundbite of hormone therapy causes breast cancer. Absolutely. What did that do to women? What did that do to the medical community and the doctors like yourself who care for us? We've basically been living with what it did to us. It basically prevented women for 20 years or at least 15 to basically manage your menopausal symptoms if they were suffering. It caused a fear, a ripple effect, which actually went around the world and yeah. is still present nowadays. I hear, I hear echoes in, in the you know, most remote countries in the world of young medical students who are now being trained and are still hearing the echo of this North American study that's now 21 years old is thou shall not prescribe hormone therapy because we're going to kill them of breast cancer. So it sent all of the physicians and all of the medical institutions scurrying under a rock. It sent all of the pharmacists to advise their patients to not touch this. And it sent women to seek alternative treatments and information because they were not going to take menopause sitting down. Right, right. Did it also increase prescriptions of other things? Absolutely. You're so good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it did. I mean, absolutely. So I called that for years and years and years, the little cocktail mm. of menopause. And so if physicians were dissuaded from prescribing hormone therapy, as they had for decades before that, all of a sudden they had to focus on the symptoms to treat. Right. And if you weren't sleeping, you got a sleeping pill. If you were feeling depressed, you got an antidepressant. If you were feeling anxious, you got some anti-anxiety medication and so on and so on. And at the time, interestingly, no names mentioned, but a study was actually coming forth at the exact moment as the WHI was being published to show that antidepressants of a certain family by a certain company were actually very good at resolving sure. hot flushes. Yeah, and they so still are. As yep. the momentum of hormone therapy went down in deep into the ditch, that prescription medication went through the roof. Coincidence? Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. they needed to resolve issues. The young trainees nowadays and the family physicians and gynecologists who have been trained since that study were barely born at that time right. and have no understanding and no clue as to why, why? antidepressants, anti-anxiolytics, and sleeping pills became the go-to for menopause. Mm -hmm. And they're prescribing and never asking a question you challenged me about the what the WHI when we had supper that night said, and I get asked the question all the time, can we stop talking about this? Mm -hmm. Do we need to churn the mm -hmm. wheel over? And, and yes, you said yes. Yes, we do. Because we need for everyone on the planet to understand the 20% of the time we have now spent so menopause is a young concept, as you know, right? In 1900, women survived to the age of 50 on average. Yep. We have now spent 123 years in the concept of menopause on this planet for most women who are lucky enough to survive to that age. And we have now spent a fifth of that entire time burdened by the shadow of that horrible study. It's unacceptable. Yeah. And that burden is impacting quality of life. Absolutely. And it is meaning that our generation is facing those glaring statistics of heart, brain, bone disease. Absolutely. That well, we had just have a huge opportunity to turn it down. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So for so let's clarify. So prescribing antidepressants in an off-label format 
which means prescribing it for something that it was not originally created for. Ken, in some of the women in my community will tell me, my hot flashes disappeared. Absolutely. Right? Our job in having this conversation and for everyone that's listening is to make sure they understand the potential risks of putting that Band-Aid, can I call it, or the duct tape Tem over top of the, the flashing option. light. Sure, yeah, a temporary sure, sure. option. Yes. Um, and without the proper education yes. and information Absolutely. to know Absolutely. that their heart and their brains and their bones and their vaginas are still at a potential risk. It borders on medical negligence. Let's call it what yeah. it is, right? And it stems from innocent in the purest sense of the word yeah trainees going into practice having never had the benefit to be taught otherwise so i love the point you're bringing because there are two ways to look at hormone therapy and prescribing hormone therapy there is a direct and we're not even going to address the wellness aspect. Sure. We know that it's efficacious for wellness. Right. Hot flushes, joint pain, vaginal dryness, libido, sleep, moods, you name it. The ramifications for health. I always look at the prescription of hormone therapy and challenge my patients. The prescription comes with a self-contract. And I want to mm. hear it on the spot. We can band-aid you with hormone therapy from head to toe. You'll never have a sleepless night again. You'll never have a hot flush. I want to hear from you what you are going to invest in for yourself to continue on your journey of wellness and health. Are you going to open the door to your front, the front of your house, and go for that walk finally because you're full of energy? That's what I see. That is why I'm so passionate and I love coming back to work every day is the consequences of that very simple prescription and the conversation we had before. The indirect effect is that wellness that may come from the antidepressant because they're now mm. not overheating, probably sleeping better, maybe having some mood benefits as well. Sure. And again, you have to question what they're going to do and how they're going to invest this wellness, which then turns around and becomes a benefit for their health, right? They're ready to physically be active. They're ready to mind their nutrition. They're ready to push that second glass of wine. They're ready to quit smoking. They're ready to say no to overburdened mm. demands on themselves. Yes. Natalie, that's a mic. <laughs> that is a mic drop collection of moments in there. That self contract yeah. Yeah. is yeah. so powerful. Absolutely. I'm going to share Absolutely. that yes. forward. You are a gynecologist, yes, uh, which is a specialist in Canada. Mm -hmm. Which for most of us means we need to be referred yes, by our do. GP or our family doctor or nurse practitioner. Or nurse practitioner. Yes. Can we talk about the model in which you work in, and even mention the Facebook community that you're a leader of? You you mentor other doctors. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, a model, the model of care, what it should be, or what it is currently. Well, we, we have had some very visionary type conversations. Yes. And so, you know, as we do this work and as we leave it for the next generation, how do you want to leave? Uh, <laughs> right? I don't want to leave. I don't. <laughs> I'm not done yet. How do you want to be remembered? To the curb, <laughs> not. Uh, I think that to not sound too negative, we have so much catching up to do right. to reinstitute the important topic. We are still facing this wave of baby boomers still crawling into menopause and the generations to come, they need to be educated. They need to be appropriately informed. We need to bring that topic back onto the shelf of the medical school and the family physician and the nurse practitioners and so on. I really honestly, and this is not a blame to the system um, or to the individuals in the system, mm -hmm. I should say, um, women are very well read nowadays. 
they are seeking information, they are able to tweeze out mm -hmm. the trash from the reality and what they should follow. Um, website like yours, <laughs> fantastic wealth of information. They are up to date, they are current in their knowledge, they know what they need, and they face the caregivers and the prescribers with the power of the pen who have not joined in and met them at the same junction of that road. That needs to be redressed. Massive amount of education needs to be done for the pharmacist. And yes. Campaigns to reach out to the government to beg and do the work we need to do to get the provincial governments to put hormone therapy on the formulary to be covered at the same level in BC yes. as contraceptive. Absolutely. You want to put a price tag to for or supplying contraception for free for the entire population. You and I understand the entire population agrees that it's a win-win-win situation. Let's look at the price tag of peri and menopause yes. and the burden to society, places of work, community, yes. relationship, and self. And let's decide if covering that by government institutions is worthy of the benefit they would. A thousand percent. We could just do the business case on osteoporosis. Absolutely. Follow one woman who breaks her hip and look at the cost Absolutely. of her caregiving Absolutely. cost over time. Absolutely. And, and you that bring, would quantify and it. And you bring a wonderful topic um, at the 10-year anniversary of the WHI. I promise I won't mention no, it again. No, it's good. At the 10-year anniversary of the WHI, this guru of osteoporosis in Texas presented at our annual North American Menopause Society a study he had done that basically demonstrated that the disappearance of estrogen for the last 10 years estrogen being the strongest and most efficacious way to continue your bone health journey and prevent fractures. Did we know that? Not necessarily. Mm. And basically demonstrated that the rate of fractures for the 10 years following the publication of the WHI compared to the 10 years before had gone up tenfold wow. in the American population. And the cost, morbidity and mortality of having significant fractures of vertebrae in hip is so well understood. Yeah. We yeah. have so many arguments for that. Yeah, right? absolutely. So I'm, I'm going to bring us back to the model thing. You know, if we look forward, um, I know a lot of North American Menopause Society certified practitioners, um, as do you. And the conversations of frustration and dismissal and disappointment, they happen with your with family doctors. So women in my community, generally speaking, I'm generalizing, believe that if something goes wrong, my doctor will know what to do. What to do. Then they're disappointed yes. if they haven't and done the reading and information that you uh, alluded to. So what is the right model if we had a chance to just build it from scratch right now for family physicians versus versus specialists? I will go back to continuing medical education training. Mm. I will go back to the medical schools and the residency program. I will go back to dedicated learning. I will go to mentorship ah. where um, you know, you're talking about the Facebook yeah. page where we've got thousands and thousands of learners who have never had the benefit of this education yeah. during their own training and are facing all of these women coming to them going, this is what I want. I read this article. Yeah. I, and the physicians do not have the time of day. They're seeing 60 patients yeah. a day by demand. Yep. They go home to do another six hours of paperwork. They're paid a pittance and they have a day or two or six a year to choose what they're going to be continuing to get educated right. on. And it almost has, I hate to use the word mandatory and the thought of it, mm. but it it's a it's a necessity. I struggle a with necessity. I struggle with that too because um 
well, we're fifty percent of the population, so making <laughs> making it making it mandatory doesn't even really fit that the definition of what mandatory yeah. Yeah. is. Yes. But yes. I do come to the defense of family physicians all the oh, time. I, I do have, as well. I have you know, if you are speaking to your doctor and you do walk away feeling dismissed or disappointed, the first thing I think of is first of all, don't fire your family doctor. Mm-hmm. You need no. your family doctor. <laughs> yes. Um, the demands that we put on them to know absolutely everything Everything about everything. everything. And I also feel that if you felt dismissed and disappointed, that I bet that doctor feels disappointed and frustrated as well because they got into this vocation because they want to help help support their patients. They feel challenged so frustrated because... I, I see that I encounter that every day, and it, you know, you have you have the woman in front of you who feels dismissed. You have the physician, so I see the you know behind the mirror of this conversation where the physicians very commonly will launch into a discussion because they met a patient today and they were trying to resolve issues, and they will come forth and say. I had no sweet clue what to do for that woman in front of me. I've never been educated. And they downgrade their own. I mean, they're they're bashing themselves. Mm, I must be stupid. I must not know enough. I must have failed something in medical school that brings me to this point. And so I take the lead as well with my patients and There isn't a single patient I've ever seen in 19 years of practice who didn't hear this conversation. They're all very (laughs) well-educated on the WHI and all the crises of the government medical school. But when they come and say, my doctor refused to send me, I will take a stand on that one. We'll come back to this. My doctor said this is natural. My physician said, let's learn to breathe through this because this is natural and it's your new baseline. I object. Right. We can go and launch into a conversation where this would never be told to the other half of the population and would never be told on any other topic of conversation. Correct. We agree. You can. It's yes. okay to say, Absolutely. I don't know, yes. but it's not Absolutely. okay to perpetuate Absolutely. misinformation. And, and I tell people when I do training and conferences, you know, you don't have to know it all. You don't have to spend the next day of your continuing medical education training becoming the expert. I'm the expert, and I will carry that with pleasure for as long as I breathe. All you have to do is ally yourself with a few knowledgeable people in the community. The women understand that there are months to sometimes a few year wait list to access this information. If we can have panels, you know, I told you over dinner and maybe a cocktail <laughs> um, and that the one of my professional dreams had been to put all of these 40 year old on their birthday in a gigantic yes. world auditorium so that we can start painting a picture of what the next 10, 20, 30 years of their lives is going to be when they're still apt, healthy and full of energy to undertake the it's about me. And to accept that self-contract. Absolutely. Absolutely. What a great moment in time for that. So so then we need a second auditorium for all of the prescribers and all of the caregivers out there, including the pharmacists, including they need to be on the same page. And we need to stop rattling nonsense that was left with us on paper, in all of the front page of the magazines and newspapers around North America on that infamous study. It's not acceptable. Okay. I'm going to try something here. Okay. You know the work, you know the audience that I have. Yes. You know the work that I do. Yes. Tell me. it's fantastic. Tell me what you think we can do from this moment forward. Exactly what you're doing (laughs) right now. (laughs) You have the power to do that. You've allied yourself with these connections and you are full, full, full of creative ways of approaching this, which fills my gap, right? I think that's true. But seriously, where I want to go with this conversation and tap your expertise is we have now a couple of generations who are even using words or vernacular that 
the meanings have changed. Absolutely. This show is not called menopause because it, when I say menopause, mm -hmm. if a woman still has her period, she's going to put her hand up and say, oh, not there yet. Nope, Society nope. told me I don't need to My learn that yet. My doctor said right. I was too young. It's impossible for me to have those symptoms. It must be something else. Correct. <laughs> and if I no longer have a period, I get... Oh, been there, done that. I don't need to hear what you have to say, Dr. Natalie or Shirley. This is not for me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. respond to that. Is it for? Of course. Right? Absolutely. When my patients and women in general ask me, when is this going to be over? <laughs> no, they ask me right? too. When is this going to be over? And I tell them it's never going to be over. We're on this menopause. Yeah. And starting with perimenopause, and we'll launch because I'll divert. We're good at doing this to one <laughs> another, but that's okay. Um, menopause is the only permanent reproductive state of life. We, are, we lose our ovarian function. There is a nothing we've discovered to change that from happening. Right. And we survive long enough to meet and learn to embrace menopause but it's going to be there for the rest of your life. And it might as well be good, right? And you, at that moment in time where we're turning to our bodies and saying, oh, by the way, I want to retire. I want to travel. I want to do all these things for the next five decades. But by the way, we're not going to give you the same ingredients that yes. your ovaries used to produce. Yes. So good luck. Yes. yes, good luck with that. Good luck right? with that. I mean, this was never a question right. in 1899 right. when menopause did not exist right. i'm being sarcastic yeah. but you know what i mean right so we are suffering and we need to redress the effects of the success of medicine and sanitation that makes us now live 30 to 40 percent 30 to 40 percent of our lives in a state of menopause it better be good Absolutely. i've been saying forever yeah. and me it's about me from now on, correct, <laughs> right? So you were talking about, you know, the different aspects of it. You know, I, I want to retire. I want to look after my grandchildren. I want to travel. And I'm going to pile on this, the I want out of this relationship. I want mm -hmm. to go back to school. I want to open a business. I want to challenge myself. And I need to feel awesome to do this. Yes. And I need to be healthy enough to know that I can invest the next 20 years, 30 years of this brand new life I'm going to design for myself. It is so powerful. This is what I love about this field and doing the work I do is the intimate conversations and listening to the dreams of my patients. Oh, my goodness. Who just launch forth. So... The model, the model is to keep screaming on the rooftops and the model is to build a second arena and let's do this. Yeah. To fill it up like we were. What's her name? Taylor Swift. Who is <laughs> Taylor she? Swift. I think we can fill that arena. <laughs> right. Can, Taylor Swift we can, we can do two evenings, <laughs> one for the 40 and over and bring some company and the other one for the caregivers amongst us and the government. She announced so today she's so going on. into theaters so we can go into theaters with well, this too. You know, it's a go. small venue. I think we can do better than that. <laughs> I really honestly think we've got a bigger audience. Yeah, yes. so true. Yes. So true. Yes. And when you're talking about your your passion for your patients and your passion for this topic, you're actually talking about yourself, right? Like you are at this stage of life where you have an amazing, <laughs> an amazing resume. I think it's just so fascinating. It's also inspiring for me, Natalie, because I, I think, you know, how we how I talk to my daughter now about career choice or mm -hmm. career choices. Choices. Can yes. you give me can you let, give me a little synopsis? Let let's never stop those choices from happening. You were right? a teacher. Yes. Well <laughs> and then how far back would yeah, you just, like to go? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, So LinkedIn profile. I was twelve when I decided I wanted to be a zoologist. Ooh. I wanted to be Dick <laughs> Van Dyke and Disney World at 6 p.m. on Sunday with, you know, Dr. Doolittle or whoever. Um, and I pursued that dream. I was actually a sea turtle researcher. Oh, so my wow. first degree and my second degree are actually in zoology. And I got to live on a beach in French Guiana and look at sea turtles lay eggs. And it was kind of very funny 
when I eventually, I, you know, the irony was I ended up studying the fibro papilloma virus in sea turtles and that grow plaques on their eyes and prevent them from being able to nest and fish and kills them. And so I turn around and I become his gynecologist, <laughs> right? But um, I had that moment where I decided that zoology was fantastic, but I needed to do something more tangible than produce theses upon theses. Okay. And um, the spark came that I was going to go to medical school, but that was sandwiching a, you know, relatively decent career in teaching. So I was also a high school biology teacher wow. between that, um, between the sea turtles and between, and I actually went to medical school to become a forensic mm -hmm. pathologist. Mm -hmm. um, you did mention the coroner a bit. But I, I have it, but let's include that. <laughs> let's include it. Yes. Um, did I tell you I get bored very easily? <laughs> I think I do too. And I have scary amount of energy. You know, I've had patients look at me and say, whatever you're on, I want the same thing. Hey. I'm like, this is a little private, you know, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I, um, the funny thing is, is I, you know, on my way here, I was kind of reviewing why exactly I know why changed the course of my medical education and decided to go in ob -GYN. It was not for uh, a lack of love of forensic pathology. It was just the diversity and the, the head and the hands-on and the, the appeal of so many different facets of that profession. To this day, I cannot remember why a fellowship in menopause appealed and why I did an elective in menopause. We had the guru of menopause at my medical school mm -hmm. or where I did my residency in Ottawa, Dr. Elaine, Elaine Jolly, Jolly, who's coming to Vancouver yeah. in November yeah. for the Canadian yeah. Menopause Society meeting. Can't wait to see her again. Um, she she launched me. She mm. She gave me permission to be a professional and use this brazen creative energy I have to look at things a different way. And so I'm of the generation where we started talking about evidence-based Based. medicine. And I often challenge my colleagues that in menopause, the evidence base has an N of one. And for those right. of you who don't know what I refer to by saying yeah. an N is the number in a study that need to be treated to obtain the clear truth about some event that we're studying or some product that we're studying. And in menopause, there are no fit all. Everyone is a different individual. person. Right. And it's probably one of the reason why um, this field of medicine, it does not appeal to everybody. Right. It's not pragmatic. It's not black and white. It's not based on numbers. It's we hard. Don't do blood tests yeah. to decide where you're at. We listen to you. Right. And we can draw conclusions as to what will best fit you. Because your ovaries are doing this on a daily basis when you're in perimenopause. And as I told you when we were dining, they land on the tarmac never to wake up again once you're in menopause. There is no point in trying to test ovaries. Let's have a conversation. Tell me where you're at. I will tell you what we can offer you. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, I, I, I went and did a fellowship in menopause. I graduated. I was probably becoming menopausal myself, um, but it, it's been an amazing, amazing venture adventure. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still as passionate as when I started, but with the additional knowledge and experience to feel just enriched by all of this and the experience I've had with all of the women that I've had the privilege to look after. And there's a couple more things that we need to mention. And the reason we, they need to be mentioned is because we're inspiring women to keep reaching that it's a staircase. So Absolutely. you found an opportunity Absolutely. to be a part-time coroner. Yes. Which was yes. one of your... Which was one of my dreams. It went full circle 25 years. I, 
I basically saw an ad when I moved to BC five years ago for community part-time corner <laughs> and I had a smile cracked up and I had already decided I was going to reduce my clinical work a little bit when I moved to BC from Ontario. And I thought, wow, I, I, I have never stopped wanting to do this work. And it was so fulfilling, such a privilege to do this work that not everybody else wants to do as Correct. well, right? It's Absolutely. difficult, it's demanding, it's scary. Um, but I did that for three years and <laughs> then uh, bought a little boat and uh, another childhood dream. And um, the little boat won. So I had to give up the community mm. corner. Otherwise, I would have never gone to the boat. And uh, and now I make gin. <laughs> and now you're Dr. Gin. <laughs> Where does that come from? I don't know. Well, I think following our hearts yeah, and our you passion bet, you and bet. variety yes, and creativity yes. and fueling. That, that was a that was a moment, and I think I I told you that story of um, the day before leaving Ontario and launching on a trip around Canada just to land in BC, where I didn't know I was going to go um, or what I was going to do there. And I was presenting a conference on menopause to a group of family physicians. I remember it being Belleville, I believe. Mm. And uh, at the end of the talk, physicians came to see me and said, we know you closed your practice and you're leaving. What are you going to do now? And I said, well, um, I've been a gynecologist for 14 years. There's some new rules. I never want to examine a vagina again. Um, that has changed since then. Um, but I, I looked at that person and I said, I've been a gynecologist for 14 years. Maybe I'll just become a gynecologist. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, do you know how to make gin? And I went, no, but I'm willing to, to learn. learn. And it became another new passion. And I've been experiencing developing recipes, developing a brand, hopefully developing a business and uh, making a lot of gin. Willing to learn uh, another yes, learning really sound challenge. And, and it's amazing. And I do that with my patients all the time. What's your dream? What mm. was that teenage dream of yours and I've had women who have done all sorts of crazy things left government jobs and yes I hear went, that all the time went and took you know master's degree yes. in theater art in England because that's what they wanted to do when they were a child and so and dream the and dream feeling and amazing yourself. through that but you have to sleep before you can right. do that and you have to get rid of your mood issues and you have to feel amazing you deserve to you sleep deserve and you deserve to feel that way absolutely. yeah before you know i could talk with you all day, all day. but before oh. we wrap this up um we were speaking not that long ago about the media mm -hmm. and the role of the media so uh you obviously have a wealth of education and experience and expertise um, I have been building an audience and trying to steer them towards that quality information. But there's another player yes. that feeds into this. Correct. Uh, that player used to be very well defined. Mm -hmm. It was traditional media. TV newspaper played a big role in the study that we were talking about off the top. Now we have many players, many platforms. Um, not everyone who's talking about women's health and menopause has accurate and quality information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you want to say to the writers, to the leaders in this space? Huh. And what, you know, what they can do to help us propel this forward? Seek the experts. Yeah. Diversify your knowledge base and where you get the information. Um, mm -hmm. Fact check. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> laughing. <laughs> Why are we laughing? <laughs> I don't know. Um, yes, and and be very careful as to what you put out there. We are facing very smart women who are yearning for information, yearning for resolution. And unfortunately, the last 20 years or the early onset of the last 20 years, um, a lot of information and a lot of ventures were basically developed mm -hmm. out of on the back of the desperation of women with yes. a wallet. Yes. And it's not fair. Yeah. It's I think ventures were developed on the back of desperation 
it's also very easy to get a business case approved when you insert one billion yes. women into a spreadsheet. Absolutely. The business absolutely. case is going to go it's forward, absolutely, whether yes. it's evidence yes. based yes. or not. And unfortunately, we're battling a losing battle because there is no way the universities, there is no way the government, there is no way the medical institutions can compete with any of this. We don't have the resources. And so we have to be very careful where we venture forth. And I rarely fail to have this very intelligent conversation with my patients who have perhaps spent thousands of dollars mm. to do blood work and have this and that adjusted, you know, everything under the moon, mm. literally, um, that things are simple and things are based on a lot of experience and no, nothing new happened in 2002 and forth. We've tweaked a few things, but all of this existed before. So we need to get on the same page about the the language we use. Yes. Um, you know, we need to talk about what is natural and what is synthetic and what is bioidentical and what is, you know, whatever you want to call the opposite of this, because there is so much misunderstanding. Mis yes. Again, on the back of women and their desperate symptoms and their checkbooks and this is not right. This is abuse by a system that was allowed to flourish again out of desperation. Yeah. We have not been kind to women. Yeah. Thank you so much. You have taught me so much along this journey and our most recent conversations. I'm feeling very energized. I'm feeling very inspired by the work that you do. The, uh, the concept of a self-contract that is going to have legs, I promise you. And I thank you for bringing up Fact Checker. We kind of laughed at that. But the the title, the job title of Fact Checker originated in traditional media. If you yeah. went to the newspaper, magazines, it still exists today. But I'm going to spin that and invite everyone who's listening to become their own Fact Checker. Yes. And yes. we will help them do that. Thank you. I think we will. <laughs> thank you for the work that you do. I so appreciate you. Shirley, You're thank amazing. you for the work that you do. I think that you allow us, you give us um, the ones that don't necessarily have the time, the energy and the resources because we're looking at a different facet and we, we're in our little box over here. But I think that you bring those groups together and you allow all of us to share in the wealth of information out there and and at the bottom of the page and at the end of the day it's to help all the women absolutely who to feel fantastic and be the healthiest they can be so every day of their lives they're having their best day Amazing. Um, this is the first conversation of many, by the way. I hope you'll come yes. back. Oh, I will absolutely <laughs> come back. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you for listening. I know you have many options for where you spend your time, so I am grateful you chose this show today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, like, do all the things, and follow me on social media at Menopause Chicks. I'd like to say a big thank you to the folks who support this show and share my mission for women's health. Vichy Laboratoire, Ferropro Iron, Feel Amazing Vulva and Vaginal Moisturizer, and Intimate Wellbeing. You can learn more in the show notes. Plus a special shout out to the team here at Oh Boy Productions. And remember, someone you know needs this information. Maybe it's you, maybe it's someone you love. So thank you for sharing and see you next week on This Show Is Not About Menopause. I love Vichy and I love working with the team at Vichy Laboratoire. For more than 90 years, Vichy has been at the forefront of skin research. Vichy shares my passion for women's hormone health education and wants everyone to have a clear understanding of the key differences between perimenopause and postmenopause, which is, of course, what I do every day. Thank you, Vichy, for joining me on this journey. 
you can learn more about Vichy's research, skin health solutions, and their line of Neovadiol face care for women in both perimenopause and postmenopause at vichy.ca.